Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. U.S. workers are being squeezed as never before. Hourly pay is down this quarter by the biggest decline on record, even as productivity is up and the work week just keeps getting longer. Have you noticed? This is a grim time for American labor, you would think, except in certain respects, it isn't. Watch workers with some of the lowest paid, least unionized, and least secured jobs these days, and you see strikes and organizing at Walmart, at retail, and fast food joints across the country. Old big labor may be in trouble, but something else seems to be bubbling up, and our next guest has been covering it. Sarah Jaffe is a freelance journalist and co-host of the Descent magazine podcast called Belabored, which covers myriad topics from the gendering of part-time work to the combative caucus more, which describes itself as the social justice caucus of the United Federation of Teachers, as well as the Fast Food Forward campaign. She's also my former colleague at Grit TV. Welcome back, Sarah. Glad to have you on the other side of the camera. I know. This is so exciting for me, Laura. <laughs> First off, I want to congratulate you and Josh Edelson on Belabored, which you can find on iTunes, and I've subscribed yes. to, and everybody watching this should. Um, covers different topics every week. Yes. And it really does give you this sort of Dickensian cliche of a picture <laughs> of the world that we're living in, like the best of times, worst of times. You know, go at it. Which one is this? Ooh, I mean, for a lot of people, it really still is pretty bad. I wouldn't say it's the worst of times yet in this country. Um, it might be the worst of times for over a thousand workers in Bangladesh when their factory collapsed. Um, it's not quite the worst of times here in this country, but it's certainly not great. Um, that said, because we've seen sort of stagnant conditions for years, people in low-wage jobs that would probably otherwise just leave, move on, find another job, um, instead are organizing. So we see workers at Walmart, we see workers at fast food restaurants who work for minimum wage or just barely above minimum wage um, going on strike around the country. Now the biggest, most visible of these campaigns has been the fast food and retail workers, but mm -hmm. the Fast Food Forward campaign. Right. Um, tell us a little bit about it. So Fast Food Forward started um, here in New York City with New York Communities for Change. And it's worth noting that the campaigns in all these different cities are, are backed and supported by the Service Employees International Union and Change to Win, the labor federation that they're part of. But in each city, they're done in partnership with a local community organization. So New York Communities for Change here in New York um, started organizing around, they work around housing issues a lot. And so they actually were going into fast food restaurants, talking to fast food workers about their housing issues and realizing that you can't fix their housing issues if they're making $7.25 an hour and their, you know, their schedule keeps getting cut. So it's, you know, 20 hours a week at $7.25 an hour. It doesn't pay any rent in New York. Fast Food Forward actually made a video, Can't Survive on $7.25. Let's take a little look. I needed some way to live. I didn't have nobody. This building is a shelter. Yeah, I, I didn't want to go in the street because they were called ACS keys. So I'd rather go in the shelter than anything. My name is China Scott. Um, I've been working at McDonald's for 10 months right now. I'm Joshua Williams. Uh, I've been working at Wendy's for a year and two months now. I make only seven twenty-five an hour. After taxes and everything, I, I see no more than two twenty. Most of that little money I have every week goes towards my son and transportation and food throughout the week. I want her to go to college. I want to give her everything that my mother didn't give to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's a struggle because at the end of the day, I keep thinking about it's a little bit of pay, and I'm a very hard, dedicated worker and. It's a lot. She be telling me, Ma, I want to go home. Oh, I said, Stinky, we are home, though. She said, no, this is not home. That's my goal, is to get out the shelter. But I can't get out the shelter with a $200 check. That's, no, that's impossible. We need a union. We have to be as one. We have to be, we have to like stand as a team. If we put in the hard and dedicated work and the sweat and the energy to support y'all and give y'all what y'all looking for, y'all main goal is, I believe that we should have our share too.
The fast food forward campaign in New York, though, is part of a national mobilization, right. all with a very similar, all with a very similar message. What do you? What is the takeaway from this? What, what's the significance of it in your view? I mean, the takeaway from this is fast food restaurants you know, on an individual level are mostly franchises, right? So if you organize one McDonald's in one place, um, you don't have a lot of leverage over the rest of them. But if you do what they've done here, which is to take a national um, view of this issue mm -hmm. and to really aim at organizing an industry or at least disrupting an industry, um, you can actually put pressure on the people at the top. So instead of saying, you know, um, Joe and Bill who own a McDonald's franchise on Canal Street, you're saying McDonald's, this corporation that has millions and millions of dollars in profits every year that has been doing better than ever since the recession, um, you can spare some extra change for these workers. But as you and Josh have pointed out, one of the other striking things about these strikes is that it's not representing large numbers of workers exactly. at the workplace. Does that make it then more of a kind of public opinion pressure campaign than a real workplace organizing effort? And does it substitute for actually organizing the majority of workers to vote for a union, say? It certainly doesn't substitute for having a union in the workplace. It absolutely does not. Um, it's similar to what's been going on at Walmart, right, where you have one or two workers in each location um, going out on strike. The Walmart workers have just gone on their first sort of prolonged strikes, but mostly these have been one-day affairs. Um, the workers are walked back in the next day with community members, um, elected officials. One of my favorite stories out of this comes from the first strike here in New York. Um, a Wendy's on the Fulton Mall in Brooklyn told one of the workers that she was fired after she had gone on strike, which is protected activity. Um, and she called her organizer, who called his boss, who showed up with reinforcements, including city council member Jamani Williams. And the organizer who saw this happen, I sadly wasn't there, has the story of standing on the sidewalk, seeing Jamani pull up in his car, jump out, toss his keys to this organizer, and run into the store, where they occupied the store, singing, dancing, chanting, until the store called the cops. They then were escorted out to the sidewalk, where they continued to sing, dance, and chant until the store took their worker back. So this really does speak to a very different sort of array of tactics. Right. Um, talk about that array and, and what it means to you. I'm thinking of organizations like the Restaurant Opportunities Center, ROC, uh, part organizing effort, part legal attack squad, right. suing people for, suing employers for back wages, part kind of startup effort, encouraging groups of workers to start co-ops. Is this... Yeah. A, a union? Is this a labor movement? What is this? I mean, it's a labor movement. It's not a union, right? And these are very different things, and they've always been very different things. And what we're seeing in this country, which has been pointed out by I don't know how many people, quite a few, that unions in the traditional sense are fading, that the NLRB framework for organizing is less and less useful because employers have figured out how to get around it. The National Labor um, Relations Board. Right, and also um, in states where public workers have the right to collective bargaining at all, um, we've seen the Scott Walkers of the world attack it. So what you're seeing in any place where there's something positive going on in the labor movement, you're seeing this sort of social movement organizing. So you're seeing the community being organized to support the fast food workers. You're seeing um, the restaurant workers holding informational pickets outside of restaurants to inform diners who are then encouraged to go inside and ask the manager how much their um, their waiter is getting paid, whether she gets paid sick days. Um, you're seeing one of the really interesting stories I've done recently was um, an SEIU local in Oregon who are using, it's a public employees local. They represent home care workers, employees of the state university, um, workers who do like child welfare, and they have five bargaining tables going on right now at the same time. And in each of those um, collective bargaining sessions, they're demanding that the state go after the banks. Mm. So they've actually written this into their demands. And so they're using not just sort of rallies and marches and the usual public pressure, they're actually using their power of collective bargaining to argue for something that would benefit everyone in the state. And the remedy isn't tax hikes, but bank justice, as right. it were. Get it from the bankers. I mean, they wouldn't be opposed to tax hikes either, but like, um, one of the problems in, in a lot of these places is public funding is being sucked out through, you know, what people call the, uh, the Wall Street skim, yeah. right? That they're getting money wherever. So um, the Chicago Teachers Union is a similar thing where they are getting involved. You know, they won their strike. They, their contract is one of the best 
teachers union contract in the country now. Um, but they're really leading the fight to keep schools open, even though, as Karen Lewis pointed out on Chris Hayes' show, their contract says that they follow the students. So they're not fighting against layoffs. They're fighting against school closings in the neighborhoods where these kids are, where it is often the only stable thing in their neighborhoods. If people want to see Karen Lewis interviewed by you and Josh, or at least hear you, yes. hear her, they can check out Belabored. Um, let's stick with the subject of the CTU for a second, yes. because you wrote a beautiful piece for Jacobin about the politics of care. Yes. And um, it was you at your best in the sense Thank that you. I thought who else is going to write this particular story about the way that this labor struggle, this situation, is gendered? Can you just talk about it a little bit? You know, some of that came out of a conversation with um, former Grit TV guest Jane McAlevey, um, where we were talking about the way striking is different in hospital situations, in schools, in any place where your responsibility on the job is not making widgets, but is caring for people. Mm -hmm. um, and so we look at this with home care workers. A lot of the home care workers who have gotten the right to organize have done so by forfeiting the right to strike at all. Um, you see this with nurses. Um, you see this with teachers, right? When Chicago, when the CTU went on strike, um, we saw a lot of people, including progressive, fairly progressive commentators who you would think would know better, sort of wringing their hands and going, well, what about the children? Don't they care about the children? And you know, you see Rahm Emanuel, who is best known for, you know, his ability to curse and, like, stabbing a knife into a table at a political opponent, you know, pantomiming that he cares so much about these children, and Karen Lewis is, you know, um, appropriately dismissive of that idea. The president of the CTU. Right, but it very much is the rhetoric that is used against teachers, especially whenever they go on strike. And we should say women. Yes, exactly. And this is... Um, this piece sort of carried forward from a piece that I wrote for Descent Magazine last winter called Trickle Down Feminism, which was sort of asking why the mainstream liberal feminist movement is so disconnected from issues of labor. That when, again, when CTU went on strike, this is a union that's led by an African-American woman. This is a union that is 80% female. There was just sort of crickets from the, you know, from mainstream feminism. And so when you're thinking about why women are in these particular jobs. In the case of teachers, this was started um, as we started to have public schools in this country. Um, Dana Goldstein wrote a wonderful post about explaining that, you know, teacher, this whole rhetoric that teachers are morally superior and they're natural carers and all of this was really used because they wanted to be able to pay less money. And mm -hmm. so they wanted women to be teachers because women, you could pay women less money. And this is, you know, nursing is also a natural job for women, all of this. And so, in order to have some respect for that work, to see care as a skill and not as just something that is inherent in you and that you're either good at or bad at, um, they really have to do things to sort of denaturalize mm. that idea, right? So going on strike is a big one. I've always thought it was a bit of a diss of, of carpenters and mechanics and male-dominated jobs where people actually do care quite a lot oh, that yeah. the product turns out all right. Absolutely. How are you enjoying doing this work, Sarah? I mean, it seems like you're energized by it. it there's, you found a place for yourself. Um, it's super exciting to read what you're doing. And yet, you drew attention to an article, which I was glad you, you mentioned, for I Today as Peace in the Nation, about what is happening to our field yeah. of journalism. Um, talk about that for a sec. Yeah, I, you know, when I brought that up on, on our podcast, I said that, you know, I got everything. I got my job with you because I was an intern at The Nation. I would not have this career had I not been an intern at The Nation. Um, and I was able to do that when I was 29 years old, after having gone back to graduate school, having been out in the, you know, quote unquote, real world for a while working. And I had money in the bank so that I could do, um, The Nation's is a paid internship, but it's a small stipend. It's not enough to live on in New York. And this internship was everything to me. I wouldn't be able to do this work without it. But it's unavailable to so many people because they don't have the money. And this is an ongoing problem in journalism, right? And journalism organizations don't have extra money, right? It's not like the nation is rolling in the chips and they're just not handing them out. Um, they're trying to figure out ways to budget every, you know, to do all the coverage that they want to do. So does that explain why we end up with a media that doesn't really have much of a yen for working people's stories or feeling about them? I think it's part of it. It's entirely possible for people who come out of a well-off background to realize that the economy that they, you know, that the, the privilege that they enjoy is not shared equally among most people and that most people don't have those opportunities. 
but still there's a difference between the connection that you feel when you um, have grown up in a union household. Item, I just found out actually, I, my app was raised by Republicans, I did not grow up with um, union, a union family at all, or so I thought. I just found out that my uncle used to be a Teamster. My parents had not told me this. Somewhere it's so, in your blood. Somewhere it's in my blood. Does it, is this problem that we're describing as bad on the internet and in bl and the blogosphere, so-called, as in uh, regular print journalism or broadcast TV? Well, on the internet, you can find a lot of freelance work. I've certainly had no pro no trouble finding people who are interested in the stories that I want to tell and who want to publish my work. Um, most of them don't have a big budget for yeah. freelancing. So again, it's this you know it's hustling stories that pay you a little bit each you know, one after another, and hoping that you can cobble together rent at the end of the month. And so far I've been lucky and it's worked and I've been really sort of pleasantly surprised at the places, the outlets that have been interested in labor stories. Because you're doing great work. What's the story you're most excited about now before we close? Ooh, you know, I'm still fascinated to see what is going to happen within these teachers unions, right? We t you mentioned briefly the uh, Moore caucus within the UFT here in New York. Um, they model themselves on the core caucus, caucus within the Chicago Teachers Union that took over and that put Karen Lewis in charge, that ran this strike and is running this um, campaign to keep schools open. Um, and I really think we're actually at a point within the sort of corporate education reform movement where... Um, people are starting to see that the emperor has no clothes, and these really are the emperors of our society, right? The Bill Gateses and uh, whatnot, uh, the Walton family, right? So um, I am really fascinated to see where that goes next. Sarah Jaffe is the co-host of Belabored. You can subscribe at her website. We'll put a link at ours.